Welcome. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here for our speaker today. She's one of my personal favorites, uh, Dr. Patricia Beaver. She lives in Ash County with her husband, Bob White, uh, nicknamed Quail. She's Professor <laughs> Emerita of Anthropology and was founding director of the Center for Appalachian Studies at Appalachian State University. She earned her PhD from Duke University and has conducted research in Appalachia, Wales, China, and Tanzania with particular interests in community through the lens of collaborative research. She serves on the Elk, Park, Elk Knob State Park Advisory Committee and is committed to Headwaters communities and their springs, streams and rivers, and native flora and fauna. She has published widely on these and other topics, including New River Headwaters History and Culture and Ethnic Diversity in the Southern Appalachians. And we're so proud to welcome Dr. Patricia Beaver. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, those of you who are live and on Facebook. Um, and when I spoke to you last time, I talked about the memoirs, uh, Neighbor to Neighbor, written by William Wilson about his family's life during the Civil War after the murder of his father, Isaac Wilson. And today, I kind of want to start with the Wilson story and then build on that narrative to talk about some events and trends after the war. As I think about the American Civil War, about rebels and Yankees, about current political partisan divisions, about the rural urban divide, and about ethnic, religious, territorial, and political wars around the globe, I wonder, how do you rebuild after brutal warfare has, not, has destroyed not only lives and livelihood, but ties between neighbors and even between kin? I certainly don't have the answers, but I'd like to venture some thoughts and some stories about things that happen in our area. And I want to start with the Civil War chaos. Um, in his introduction to the Wilson, uh, this is the Wilson memoir, Neighbor to Neighbor. I have more copies back there if anybody's interested. Um, in his introduction to the Wilson memoir, historian John Ensco says, quote, the events surrounding his father's death and their immediate repercussions make up merely the first few pages of what becomes an extended chronicle of other subjects. was a turning point of sorts and served to escalate the violent recrimination that characterized the area's internal conflicts. It brought new attention to North Fork community from both Confederate conscription officers and home guard units who more actively sought out dissenters and forced confrontations that often results in killing on both sides. From this time, Wilson noted, animosity sprang up and the word Yankees and rebels signifying the opposing camps and untold suffering and violence were ushered in. Soon after secession, according to my friend, historian Ron Eller, who some of you may know, uh, North Carolina passed the first conscription act in the nation's history. Any farmer could be conscripted into the North Carolina militia and the Confederate army to fight in Tennessee. A goodly number deserted, including several elders and more, some more than once, as we all know these stories. Ron He was six foot two, a big, burly, moonshine drinking mountain man 
He could be kind of rough and he cried. I think it's because this was a story his mother had told him about the family over there. He said that from that point on, every Eller on our end of the county was a Republican. The war, by no means, after the war, the war, by no means, was forgotten. There was military government in Tennessee and in certain parts of North Carolina. By this time, all the Confederate soldiers and the boys who had gone over to the Union had gotten back and had to live together. Some of them were mere boys when they entered the Army and were now seasoned veterans. Many of this group found it rather hard to adjust themselves to the situation. Granddaughter of Isaac Wilson, Neva Hash, who lived in my house, which was one of your ancestral houses, explains that, quote, there were two or three sets of Wilsons, part was Democrats and part was Republicans. Her grandfather, Isaac Wilson, was a Democrat and a Methodist, but Mama's daddy, also a Wilson, and mother, a Jenkins, were Republicans and Baptists. So Ron Eller tells, again, in about 1907, Eller's grandfather and his brothers left the family farm to look for ways to make a living in the changing economy. Working first for the timber industry on Mount Mitchell, they then returned to Ash County, and setting out from home one last time, they began walking north along the North Fork of the New River to the junction of the North and South Forks and on into the coal fields of Southern West Virginia. There they would quote, became coal miners and Democrats because in West Virginia, the coal operators were Republicans and the miners, John L. Lewis and others were Democrats. So I wanna talk a little bit about rebuilding community. So in the aftermath of the Civil War, as families went about the process of rebuilding shattered lives, kin ties superseded partisan differences then, as now, even in a climate of uncertainty and lawlessness following the war. According to Will Wilson, neighborhood ties were being rebuilt. He cites the example of John Wilson, neighbor and friend of Isaac Wilson, who had crossed over to join the federal troops, but proved to be a mediator and supporter of his old friend's widow, despite their political differences. While some soldiers returned from the Civil War and headed west in search of new possibilities, others focused on making a living and making a life locally, redeveloping local trade and mercantile ventures. A farmer down the road, O.L. Brown describes down the road, this is down uh, 88 uh, along the North Fork of the New River. Uh, O.L. Brown describes the small farm in which he grew up that, quote, supported a sufficient number of livestock and produced nearly everything for many years necessary to keep a large family going. Occasionally, there was a beef steer for sale. In our early years, wool from a dozen or more sheep on the place. This valuable product was washed, carded, spun, and knitted into stockings and socks for the entire family by our diligent mother. In the fall of the year, our father used to haul in his horse drawn wagon apples, beans, shell beans, potatoes, chestnuts, and other edibles to markets in Tennessee, um, in, in, I'm sorry, to, in Tennessee and Virginia. He usually went to Bristol, Tennessee, Virginia, which was about 60 miles away and separated from us by three mountain ranges. At least a week, sometimes more, was required for the round trip. The Brown parents had come of age during the Civil War when formal education was disrupting. They read an array of newspapers and monthly magazines as well as religious texts and the Bible. They had a Methodist father and a Baptist mother. By the end of the 19th century, local village provided an array of goods and services for the sake of home and farm community. And there were multiple villages at the crossroads on the North Fork 
It was Tamarack or Potter County and Sutherland and Creston and Chris, uh, Clifton and Trout and so forth and so on. And the same was true in Ash County. Sutherland, for example, featured general merchandise stores whose owners bought both uh, goods, brought goods in from afar and bought local products, a farm and forest. Churches, schools, post offices, and other specialized services were located within a reasonable distance, walking distance, of even the most remote households. Sutherland, for example, also featured a law office, a tannery, a cheese factory, a boot and shoe shop, and a doctor's office. While some people were traveling to far off places like Oregon or even Japan, as in the case with Will Wilson, Others traveled little, but had access to goods and services of the wider society and markets and ideas beyond, beyond the world of the mountains. Through this elaborate network of roads and trails and exchanges, they carried people and goods and ideas and news and letters and newspapers from village to village. And most importantly, the schools were reopened. Catching the train in Shounds, you could travel to the West. Rail cars have facilitated migrations from North Carolina and Tennessee to Idaho, Idaho and Oregon of some significant numbers of local residents since the Civil War. This accelerated in the early 20th century as a growing population increased pressure on local farmland and as news of opportunities for farm work, especially herding sheep, the availability of farmland in the West and later work in timber traveled back and forth along the railroads. As a consequence, and not unlike the Irish diaspora in America, which where you find more Irish live in, living in America than in Ireland, there are no doubt more descendants of our area, and particularly North Fork family, living in locations like Idaho and Utah and Oregon than on the North Fork headwaters of the New River. The local South and Martin family history was published in 1997, developed by D.A. South, son of Grover and Ora Martin South living in Salt Lake City, Utah. In that account, D.A. South describes Grover South, born in Tamarack or Pottertown in 1887, raised in Sutherland, married to Ora Wilson, as having followed his first cousin, Emmett Thomas, to Idaho. He attributes Emmett Thomas with responsibility, quote, for getting many relatives and friends to move to my lad, Idaho, from North Carolina. He helped them find work and get settled. Local knowledge here of herding sheep, of horses, of making do as farmers, prepared them to thrive while some prospered as they took their skills to town and their children grew up in local schools and, bought and sought new horizons further west. So largely Baptist and Methodist, some became Mormons in Utah. Yet their kin ties to Ash County and Johnson County sustained their transition to the West. D.A. South recounts the following story of D.L. South, born in 1915 in Genesee, Idaho, son of Ollie Mae Martin, who is, if anybody knows your local, that's his son of, which you do, son of Jerd and Polly Martin from Brushy Fork Road and Callie Knight's sister. Anyway, Dio was herding sheep for Mrs. Humphreys when he ran into Ed Wallace, a North Carolina cousin, herding sheep for another ranch. D.L. and Ed let their herds run together for a few weeks, enjoying each other's company. The big task came when they had to separate the herds. <laughs> they built a brush corral, and with the help of other shepherds, finally, as my daughter said, separated the sheep. <laughs> <laughs> In, a, in one case of reverse migration, Boyd Banks, who lived downriver on Baker Holler in Ash County, 
explained that his father, Chester Banks, was originally from Lawrence, Kansas, but migrated to Myrtle Creek, Oregon, in search of work cutting timber and to escape the Dust Bowl. There he met Ray Lewis and other friends from Ash County with whom he became friends and traveled east. Boyd explained that it was common at the time for men to, to take sheep or cattle into the mountains in the spring and bring them back down in the fall. And if their losses hadn't been much, they would get a bonus. The work was seasonal, which allowed them to come home if they chose. Chester came back east with Ray Lewis for a visit and in Ash County met Ethel Johnson from Mountain City, most likely at church. There he stayed and married and became an Ash County farmer. Mrs. Banks is now 100 years old. Caroline and Isaac Wilson, again the memoirs, sons Robert and John married sisters Sarah and Becky Wilson. The sisters' parents had gone west to Missouri prior to the Civil War, where Sarah was born. Although their parents returned east when Sarah was only six weeks old to live near Trade, Tennessee. Is that mine? Let me see. I'm going to do this. Just make sure. Okay. Um, Sarah's grandfather Jenkins took his dog with him to Missouri, but the dog returned to Shannon. Grandfather is reported to declare that he wouldn't stay in a place where his dog wouldn't stay. <laughs> so he came back. My own beaver great grandparents left Yancey County for Buncombe County and then went to Missouri and stayed. A note on religion on Quakers and Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians. In about 18, so I'm going back a bit, in about 1830, David Worth, who was a Quaker, born in 1810 in Guilford County, came to the Creston area in Ash County. Worth ventured to the mountains, most likely to acquire skins for tanning, as he had trade, trained as a tanner, and to buy roots and herbs for a family drug firm in Greensboro. Through the decades, Worth became quite successful. In the period prior to the Civil War, David Worth, Quaker, along with Presbyterian and Methodist neighbors, built Worth Chapel. It was a small, unimpressive building in Creston that Worth's chapel was initially non-denominational, attended by partisans on both sides of the political perspective in a village plagued by lawlessness and other, quote, ravages of war. When, after the war, when David Worth died in 1888, he left land for a new church, bank stock from which to pay a minister, and directions to affiliate with the Holston South Methodist Conference. The new church was completed in 1902 with contributions, materials, labor, and financial support from the whole Creston community. So a Quaker, slave owner by marriage before the Civil War, Worth died a Methodist. Woodrow Wilson Weinbarger at a meat camp had an interesting observation. He was born in 1913 and he had lots of wonderful stories to tell, including this one. He said, there was a book put out some years ago called Blue Ridge Breezes about the early days in the mountains here. This guy came up the mountain. Now there was Methodist and Baptist and there was not Presbyterians. He didn't know a lot about them, and he inquired about it. He went to a woman's house, and the woman answered the door, and he asked her, were there any Presbyterians in the area? And she said, not knowing what Presbyterian was, she said, I don't know, but Billy Bob's got the skin of every animal around here. <laughs> so you go out there and look. Billy Bob was a husband. <laughs> I want to switch gears a little bit and note on the images of Appalachia from the outside. Appalachia is a place and it's an invented idea and we have to look for its origins in that what we call the local color movement in American fiction. This was a movement in American fiction that would go to particularly rural places 
and look for the particular peculiarities and so forth and write really elaborate descriptive works on them. Um, and there were new mag magazines that rose in popularity following the Civil War. Magazines like Harper's, Lippincott's, and Scribner's, quote, all designed to entertain the new middle-class audience and sell magazines by, quote, telling their middle-class audience what it wished to hear and that it was the center of the universe and the true bearer of American culture. So local color writers traveled the railroads from New England following the timber industry into the mountains, particularly to resort areas like Asheville, Lindwall, uh, uh, Blowing Rock, uh, Hendersonville, and so forth. And they, quote, discovered a new Appalachia. They created, they invented the idea of Appalachian otherness, the idea that Appalachia was a strange place inhabited by peculiar people who were quaint and backward and uncivilized, unchurched, unenlightened, and white, that is, hillbillies, who needed help. Also following the war, the Civil War, the Northern Protestant missionary movement in America shifted its focus from the Deep South and its post-war race question to Appalachia. From the local color writers, they perceived Appalachia as inhabited by pure white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who were unchurched because denominations were not represented there, but salvageable through their uplift efforts. As regional scholar, Loyal Jones, whose recent passing we honor, has noted, quote, never have so many Christians been been sent to save so many Christians has been has been the case in this region. Northern Protestant denominations use the local color fiction writers fiction to raise funds and solicit donations of clothing delivered sometimes in missionary barrels to help support their mission efforts in Appalachia. My friend Jane Miller Banks tells the story of the Catholic church missionary barrels that came to Laurel Springs, her grandma in Ash County, her grandmother, Dottie Bear Miller, was recipient of a long, full wing mink coat. It was so warm and toasty that she wore it on cold days to milk the cows. <laughs> <laughs> so reading carefully the local color tales, the mission saw the problem of Appalachian whiteness as one of isolation from culture and learning and progress in American ways, something they could remedy. But in creating the myth of whiteness, black people would become invisible. And I wanted to say something quick about slavery in the mountains. Going back to our early history, the high reaches of the headwaters were hunting grounds for native peoples for 10,000 years. And so there was just a, a recent Euro-American frontiersman who followed them in the 18th century. The first settlers, English, German, French, Swiss, were well established by the 1790s, developing a hunting, herding, farming livelihood. The dream of every family was land ownership, and the first priority was self-sufficiency. But a frenzy of speculation found absentee owners controlling most of the land and selling it at a profit. Nevertheless, those who came first, married well or brought wealth, tended to have the advantage. Later immigrants and those with fewer resources or further up the river, where valleys narrowed and on up the steeper mountain slopes, settled <laughs> on up the river. By the 1850s, most Ash County farmers consisting of farms consisting of 50 to uh, 200 acres were involved in some kind of commerce, some kind of commercial production. Ash County was a leader in West, leading Western North Carolina, producer of buckwheat, rye, molasses, and cheese. Most farms also grew tobacco for sale, wheat, and corn hunted, raised livestock, and gathered forest products. 
the biggest landowners in Ash County, the 6% who owned 50% of the wealth acquired enslaved people to work that land. Across the region, slavery was significant everywhere because it supported wealth. Most slave owners lived in and around the county seats where political and judicial control was centralized. Following the Civil War, many free Black people stayed in the region, particularly if there were jobs and land, but their stories remain largely unrecorded, evidence of Black invisibility in the regional images. What poet uh, Af uh, poet Frank X. Walker calls Afrolatchian. For example, my students and I met Dora Maxwell Wellington Horton, in, born in 1915 in Creston. She attended the school in the New Hope Church and married Ed Wellington sometime in the 1930s. They moved to Wellington property on Peak Road. Dora and Ed raised six daughters and a son. Harry and Ethel Stout and Ed and Dora Wellington, in-laws and neighbors, lived near each other on Peak Road. Like their white neighbors, the Wellingtons made their living from farming and raising livestock. Mrs. Horton recalls they raised beans, tobacco, corn, and everything they needed to subsist as well as beef cattle, hogs, chickens, and cats and dogs, and they churned butter. Mrs. Horton liked to fish and eat the good trout from the New River. Ed did, quote, strong work, farm labor for neighbors. Mrs. Horton reflected, I worked when I was a child. We lived on the farm and I worked. And when I grew up, I still worked on the farm. I raised my children to work and every one of them worked. They work now. I raised them to work. While her mother did washing for other people in their homes, not until her husband died did Mrs. Horton work outside her home. Rural electrification not only changed the way rural residents looked at the world, Mrs. Horton said that it changed the way they looked at the house. She grew up without electricity or telephone. You had to get the dust out of the corners after a rural electric. <laughs> she says, later we got electricity and we got the telephone, a party line. White neighbors, Russ and Trill Brown, lived on the adjoining farm to the Wellingtons. They lived side by side as neighbors and friends. The Black Stouts and Wellingtons and the White Browns, or the Browns who were white, helped each other in many traditional ways as a sharing of labor knew no racial bounds. Russ Brown helped the Celts and Wellingtons by using their truck, using his truck to haul their produce to market. In turn, they helped the Browns harvest their honey and their apples. No money changed hands. Terry Stout owned a team of horses that he used to haul for other people. Doc Robinson, who some of you remember, who was white, treated everyone in the family, and Dora considered his son, Joe Robinson, who was a teacher at, at Riverview, to be one of her oldest and best friends. On the question of color, Mrs. Horton remarked, it was just as easy then as it is now. You had your friends and that was it. People is just people, and that's the way it is. Dora's husband, Ed, died in 1975 at the age of 80, and Dora moved to Boone to look for work. There she met and eventually married the widower, Reverend, R Reverend Rhonda Horton. My students and I interviewed her in Boone in the year 2000. While Dora Wellington Horton talked about her work and the lack of play, when finally asked about how hard her life must have been, she observed, that's a beautiful life. That was a beautiful life, living on the farm. I enjoyed my work and I enjoyed my family. Yes, I enjoyed it. When my children was little, I enjoyed living there. You lived on the farm, you worked on the farm, yeah, you didn't think about it. You just know what you have to do, and you just worked on that. Mrs. Horton passed away in 2006. So, by the turn of the century, the economy had changed from a mostly self-sufficient 
to a pro predominantly dependent economy. Cultivation high up the slopes, decreasing size of farms, high population density, and pressure on the land, the rising productivity of flatland farming outside the region with mechanization of agriculture, and the lure of new employment opportunities led local young people and whole families to, for, to journey down the mountain to job opportunities, opening in Piedmont textile mills, upriver in coal mines in eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, and to western farms in Idaho or timberlands in Oregon, accelerating after World War II as people were venturing north to find work in Detroit or Cincinnati, rural Pennsylvania, and elsewhere. Back on the North Fork, Council Maine, and many of you probably know Council Maine, born in 1925, says, when I was young, there was 10 people to one now. You see, here's an area where everybody has moved out of, and nobody can go back. This man asked me, why all those houses rotted down over here? You know what I told him? I said, the people left here that had good houses. They left here because they couldn't get work. You just couldn't live. And when they left the houses there, there was nobody that needed that house. And they just left it. And it was set right there and locked down. Over there, three houses just rotted down. People were jumping all over that right now. But back then, nobody wasn't trying to get in here. They was trying to get out. But for those who stayed, especially at the highest elevation communities, at the headwaters, making a living was hard. Anna Potter tells us, we didn't take the laundry to the laundromat. You had to dig yourself a sack of roots like ginseng to buy groceries. We just dig just anything that they bought. Black cohosh, burdock root. We traded with the roots. It's what I got my eating with. See, my husband worked, but it took more food for all our, to keep all our children. So I had to get out and dig roots in the wintertime. There was a store down there at the forks of the road. I had roots to sell them. We bought things. I'd walk to the store to get something to eat. I bought sugar, coffee, things like that. I never had a ready-made dress. I made the dress I'm wearing. We made a garden every year. We raised our corn and wheat. That's what you made flour with. We had to go to the forks of the road to the grist mill to take the corn. We made cornbread and buckwheat bread. I've strung a lot of green beans, strung beans, canned beans, and dried beans. I've made dried apples too. Anna Potter's younger brother, Rat Mains, 89 at the time, we talked with him, lived all his life in the community. Though like many men, he served in the military in World War II and was injured in the Pacific. Rhett was expansive about the crops that he raised and the foodstuffs that were available to families in Pottertown from subsistence farming. He said, every house, every house had a barrel of kraut and a barrel of molasses. They had peas, taters, turnips, Hanovers. You know what a Hanover is? Rutabagas. And they'd kill a couple of big hogs and beef. They raised their corn, and a grist mill was closed, so they ground the corn. They'd raise buckwheat and had pancake flour. We really didn't need too much. Coffee and sugar was about all we got at the store. Well, maybe flour. Evelina Idol, another wonderful lady, said, Mother was a very proud, sophisticated lady in her own way. Her clothing was just so. She wore suits and hats and gloves and to church. One suit she had was pink with a hat. And another was a burgundy suit with a tie. Mama made some of her clothes and she could quilt and sew too. She had chickens, cows, milk, eggs, and made butter and buttermilk. She was a great gardener. She had a little raspberry patch at the corner of the garden, was so proud of that. Called them tame raspberries. She would pick them by the gallon and we'd sell them to neighbors. Evelina's very resourceful father, Sharecroft, drove the school bus, was a carpenter, a general handyman, doctored animals, and was deputized to settle conflicts in the community, sang and played the piano for church, 
and learned to knit and crochet. Up until 1966, there were four stores doing business in the community of Pottertown, serving as the financial centers of the community and for the local economy. Places where neighbors could buy and trade and sell products. Pearl Eller ran the store and kept the Tamarack Post Office on South Road when her son Edgar was growing up. Most of Edgar Eller's neighbors, the roots and herbs, they'd sell turkeys, chickens, eggs, just whatever they could raise and take them to the store and trade them up, trade them for groceries. Growing up on Sutherland Road, Council Maine's earliest work was in the cornfields, hoeing corn and potatoes. But when he was a little older, maybe 14 or 15, he would dig roots and herbs right under the elk knob and make more money and easier too. He could work in the woods. It was a lot cooler working in the woods in hot weather. There was catnip and wild cherry bark and ginseng, a lot of other things. Bone set, blood root, galax leaves, they used that for decorating. He would buy or sell or trade his gathered goods at Ellison's store. He also caught and sold rabbits. We'd take them to the store and they'd pay a dime a piece for them. They may maybe go into Baltimore or New York for people to eat. You see, they take the fur off of them and make fur lined jackets out of that and rabbit's foot. You carry, you always carry a rabbit's foot. So good luck how many of you carry the rabbit's foot. Yeah, right. Another source of change or exchange goods was chestnuts. There was an abundance until the blight, which was which started in about 1910. Uh, had its impact on tree death. Council recalls, on my way to school, I'd go along the road where there was a lot of these chestnut trees, and I would stop and pick my pick my pockets full of chestnuts, take them down to the store, and trade them for pencil or a tablet or maybe a bite of candy. David Hazelmaine had a store, and they bought a Model A truck, and Dave, start, Dave started trading and he later bought a 1937 Chevy truck and said, I just got to messing around and I would buy and sell and so forth. He also, his daughter, his daughter Gail said, anything they had to sell, sell, he'd trade. Baron Little, a dealer from West Jefferson, came through on a weekly basis to stock his stores, his store with uh, groceries, but also overalls, hats, shirts, socks, feed, tools, medicine, tobacco, and candy. He also carried neighbors to work from Tamarack to work in Tom Walsh's bean field in Johnson County. And he trucked families to the north to work uh, uh, various kinds of work. Most of the herb suppliers who were neighbors traded out and uh, Dave made sales receipts for 1941, three months, included balmony, bone set, catnip, elder flowers, live plant, lobelia herb, peppermint leaves, thin rost cherry, and witch hazel leaves. And I'm telling you this because it suggests an incredible local knowledge of the flora. Sales to Todd Drug Company in 1941 for two months, added burdock, maidenhair, mandrake, sarsaparilla, spearmint, strawberry leaves, and wild yam. Prices ranged from six cents for strawberry leaves to $13 for witch hazel. Uh, Dave Main bought from his neighbors for resale a lot of other products, chickens, country ham, tub butter, eggs, ducks, turkeys, geese, any kind of poultry, hogs, and about anything you had to sell. He called, called cabbage to South Carolina and brought cotton seed back for cattle feed. He brought sweet potatoes, peaches, and whatever was in season. Down the road, where the valley opens into good pasture land, Cat Love told us about the Sutherland families whose income and wealth derived from the prosperous cattle industry. She says, we was all can up and down the road. There were five Sutherland houses, all built by John Wilson, another one of us. Yeah, Wilson folks. 
Each one of the Sutherlands had their own farm and their own cattle and sheep, but everyone had a few sheep and cattle. For the heavy work, we had oxen. Everybody had a few hogs back then and guineas. We raised turkeys and chickens. But my daddy always felt with, dealt with cattle. You see, they had they would drive the cattle to Glade Springs to the railroad track. That's where he met my mother at my granddaddy's house. That's where he kept the cattle overnight. We would drive them to Mountain City, and Daddy would get so mad at the ladies over there. They'd come out with their aprons on and keep them out of the yard <laughs> and scare them to death. And they'd just scatter all everywhere, all around town. You know, back then, they'd drive them on the road. They didn't haul them in trucks like they do now. They'd take them from here to the rail hood ahead in Glade Springs. The market was in Abington. So he hired men to help him move cattle in the spring and fall. The last of September was when you moved the, the, to uh, Virginia, to Lodi, Virginia, then back here over the summertime and put him and back through Mountain City and put him on the mountain to graze. He kept quite a number of cattle. That's the way we made our living back then. Down there at Modoc, they would raise, they would graze on the mountain right outside of trade. We always kept some there. Um, cattle that graze on that mountain grow bigger than cattle down here. Hmm. What I'm describing is a subsistence first economy of livestock production, especially in the broad bottomland, supplemented by fairly extensive root digging and herb gathering characteristic of areas with little access to rich bottomland and great access to the high elevation woods. Local knowledge of the ecology of flora and fauna was extensive. Other businesses in the community, as I mentioned, included sawmills and so forth. So as I kind of wrap up, I want to return to religion. Appalachia's regional religious tradition is uniquely American, a product of history, a uniquely American creation, a product of history, geography, and spirituality, according to historian Deborah McCauley. It originated in the European Reformation, the German Baptist Brethren, 17th century Scotch-Irish Presbyterian sacramental revivalism, <laughs> plain folk camp meeting, and the great revival on the frontier at the beginning of the 19th century. Churches were largely independent of denominational structures operating from their associations. They're not, they were not listed in the yellow pages under churches or in the places of worship lists in the newspapers. Mountain churches embrace a form of Calvinism, emphasizing grace and the Holy Spirit that expresses itself through tender, heartfelt worship practices. People don't speak of being born again. Churches are not hierarchical or mission-oriented, and salvation is not a personal decision for Christ. Rather, salvation is a gift, a gracious gift from God based solely, solidly on God's love and compassion. It had a communal head as a communal focus. Salvation is not a decision, but an ongoing process, sustained by, quote, a sweet hope in my breast, which sums up the decidedly gentle and regionally specific Calvinism, which is the mountain's historically original an enduring contribution to American Christianity. Am I preaching here? So <laughs> Edgar Eller, uh, so some of you knew, a great storyteller, passed away last month. And he's one who I think lived such a life that he never had an unkind word to say about anyone. Evelina Idol says, we attended Elk Knob Baptist Church. There was a beautiful baptizing place at the side of the church, beside the picnic tables, where they would pond up the creek with stones to make it deep enough. I was baptized at Prophets Grove Baptist, where they would pond up Meat Camp Creek and have baptizing alongside the parking lot. 
Mother and Daddy took us to church and to revivals. I made my profession of faith during the revival there, and we witnessed to my twin brother, who also made his profession of faith the next week. Leroy and I were baptized together. We didn't make it a point to say what religion you were. You believed in God. Your faith was in God. It was not a denomination. I remember growing up that we went to other churches in different denominations. Patsy Shaw Fuller, so some of you know, originally from Shams, married to Ed Grellin for over 55 years, kept the record books dating from the year 1900 of the Elk Knob Missionary Baptist Church, one of four churches on Sutherland Road. She said, I'll never forget the first time I went to church. It was the first Sunday I was here. Evelina Idol's daddy, Mr. Lloyd Miller, stood up in front of the congregation and said, the Lord has blessed us with a lot of things, but he's blessed us with another piano player now. <laughs> I've played the piano ever since. One of the stereotypes that we have uh, that come out of the, the, uh, the stereotypes of Appalachia was that people were isolated and they were uneducated. And we've seen the commerce that per pervades even the most remote places. We've seen the availability of schools. But let me present this another way through the story of a romance. Evelina found a batch of letters between her parents when they were courting in the late 20s to early 1930s. The postman would carry the letters with no postage over Pottertown Gap between Lloyd Miller in Meek Camp and Leola Maine in Tamarack. These enrich our ideas about community, about working out, about education and literacy, and about love. Said so mom and daddy would ride, either ride a horse or uh, either walk or ride a horse to see each other. It was a horse, on a horse, it, I'm sorry, it was an hour or more by horseback ride. The letters talk about their work and their family and community and gossip and arranging meetings, but and church was a common venue for them to get together. Leola writes to Lloyd February 3rd, note that date, February 3rd, 1928. Dear Mr. Lloyd, I will answer your letter, which I received. Was glad to hear from you, but you never answered my question. Listen, dear, if you ever take a notion to come over here, you can write to tell me. Gee, I guess you're having a fine time, but if you saw, saw your shadow yesterday, you may stay home for a long time. <laughs> well, guess I won't go to preach on Sunday as the preacher isn't coming. I'll close for tonight. Just wonder what you're doing to pass the time today. It is Saturday. I'm going to Mr. J.S. Stevens' sale. This is the Stevens' store. Um, it is for the highest bidder. Of course, I won't bid. Me and Daddy is going. Well, guess you think I've written enough. Ha ha. From one who loves you best. Answer soon if you wish. X, 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 X. And then there's a Y, K, W, which is stands for you know who. Oh. We learned. Remember first, remember sweet. When we first did meet, I loved you then. I loved you still. I love you now and always will. X, X, X. Lloyd writes to Leona, Meet Camp, North Carolina, 1929, July 17th. Dearest sweetheart, we'll drop you a few lines and answer you answer to your most kind and welcome letter received today. Guess you're done hoeing corn by now. We're not done by a whole lot. I've been cutting some blistered timber for Mr. Marson. I've got one tree cut this evening. That is doing some, isn't it? He shares caught gossip about comings and going in the neighborhood. He said, well, it's all we're in bed, but me and it's late. We'll close for, for now, for this time. Answer soon and all news from the someone, Y-K-W-X-X. Honey sweet, crowd sour, you say the day, I'll fix the hour. <laughs> <laughs> I want it. Sum up by talking about the idea of the commons. Brought to America by the Scots Irish, who maintained a portion of the woods to be used communally, mostly for livestock, but also for hunting wild game, 
collecting honey, wild crafting, digging roots and gathering leaves and so forth. Will Wilson talks about going camping on top of Elk Mountain in 18, in around, as we're guessing, 1879. 150 years later, people still go hiking and camping on top of mountains, sometimes on other people's land because in the neighborhood, people sometimes think of mountains that way. But what happens when gates and fences restrict that use? Again, Council Sack says, back when I was little, it used to go anywhere and get whatever you needed and nothing, nobody would say anything to you. That was a way of life. That we didn't have these no trespassing signs. The tops of mountains were just for everybody. In these headwaters community, the gated community planned for the top of the ridge below Elk Knob went bust and turned into, through a series of events, a state park. And I hope you've all been there. People were wary at first, not suspecting what might happen there. But a community committee was formed, thanks to Tommy Wall and others, to work with the park and have members of the community participate. At, every September, we now have Elk Dog Community Day, celebrating the communities that have joined the park Pat Eller emerged as one of several community leaders and organized the county's largest coverage dinner in the park. We developed this other book, which I'm going to show you about, Book of Narratives, as a gift to the community. All of these things are meant to honor the past, realize its value, and therefore the importance of the people that live here and imagine the future. So, Finally, finally, what are our resources? What of the present and the future? Throughout Appalachia, we have a vast and precious ecology that is in danger. We have strong communities with deep histories of multiple sustainable ways of making a living off the land. We have social relations in families and churches, volunteer fire departments, neighborhoods, that flow through our valleys and around our hillsides. We have a moral society based on the idea of kinship as a value about how people should behave towards one another. Egalitarian values are echoed, echoed in mountain churches where people address one another as brother and sister and assemble as a family of Christ. Self-sufficiency was ideal in families and communities People were expected to work hard and take care of themselves, but neighbors expect to help neighbors and help each other in times of trouble. We value peaceful cooperation. We don't like conflict, but communities are largely invisible and lie beneath the surface. Kicking into action in floods, ice and snowstorms, fires, deaths, and other emergencies. We build community over time through visiting meeting on the road, in the post office, the stores, the parks, the Johnson County Historical Society, and the Welcome Center, the drug stores, even Walmart and McDonald's, helping, supporting school events, local festivals, being first responders, volunteer firefighters, and working alongside each other, having fellowship. We survived <laughs> civil war, world wars, industrialization, modernization and globalization of the 20th century. We're now struggling with the challenges of the 21st century. We have a lot to build on, and if we do it together, we can do some good things. This is our legacy and our inheritance. Thank you very much. <laughs> This is Neighbor to Neighbor, and there are copies back there if you're interested. This is a Civil War memoir with essays. That was, and, and then in the year 2000, or really it was uh, 89, I started taking students in, in a graduate program uh, along uh, the uh, the North Fork Headwaters, the New River. I was really interested in the reputation. It started with an interest in the reputation of Pottertown Tamarack as a sort of a 
uh, a dangerous place. And I thought, well, the, what, there's, there's not, it's not a dangerous place. And so why has this reputation persisted? So we started interviewing people um, on uh, below Elk Knob and kind of moved down the river. And then I was interested in it. Just as we, we migrated down the river, and it did a lot of interviews with different people, and students did interviews. And then after 10 years of really collecting information, and each student was required to do a certain amount of work and then uh, do re research papers and presentations and so forth, um, that class changed and became something different. Somebody else taught it, and I was thinking of retiring. And so we pulled all the interviews together in this book. It's called Voices from the Headwaters. Mm -hmm. And it's stories from Meat Camp, Tamarack, or Potter Town, and Sutherland, North Carolina. And um, actually, I was working with the Elk Knob Community Heritage Organization, or ECHO, which had formed around the, the opening of the park. And so they approved every interview that's in here. They read them and, and decided which should go. But they also, and we added more from the meat camp side of the mountain, they also said set the boundaries. They said it needs to go from the stop sign on 194, up southern uh, meat camp road over the mountain and down to uh, Sutherland, the intersection with uh, Highway 88 stop sign to stop sign. And so I did sneak in an interview with Judge Stevens because I could not bear to leave that out. No. But we did interviews and then um, the, they were edited down and we have a photograph of the, each person who was interviewed, their stories. And then, um, this is a CD of voices and it's actually, the voices of the people who were interviewed, a number of people who were interviewed, like William Weinbarger uh, uh, and Walter Lloyd Miller, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested, we have these for sale. This was what I considered the gift back to the community that uh, allowed us, our students, to do this research. So that's what these things are. Questions, comments? Yeah. Are you familiar with the book, The Upland South by yeah. Jordan Bychoff, I think is the author's name. Um, it was, it, I mean, what he did, you know, was he, he took barn styles and house styles and tracked those around the country to show oh. migrations. Oh. Oh. out of this part of the world right in particular out of the watauga river valley but also Fantastic. here right and it's a really interesting oh, that's um, wonderful. it's called the upland south by jordan bychoff it's a hyphenated b-y-c-h-o-v i think is okay everybody hear that mm -hmm. okay we need to note that thank you yeah. my grandfather so was j.s stevens by the way oh. so <laughs> I'm very familiar. Oh, great! Yeah. So Joe's. He was my uncle. My uh, my mother was his older sister. Okay. Well, uh, have you seen the interview? No, but I well, I really I want. To. Okay, good, good. It was really wonderful day that we yeah. spent with uh, with Joe, and we went to um, we looked at the record books mm -hmm. from his father's store, mm -hmm. and uh, those were. I, I find store records incredibly interesting because they give you the details of day, daily life. And so he took us up into the top of the barn where they were all stored and we looked mm -hmm. at record books. Uh, yeah. They're now archived. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they allowed us to, the family allowed us to archive those in the, they're in the Appalachian collection of uh, Belk Library at ASU mm -hmm. as our, we had missed Every other store records, and we've got one or two uh, little pamphlets, and the same thing with um, anyway. Well, store I think record the reference in there to the going to J.S. Stevens is sales. Yes, I think Grandpa had a store up on uh, 
near more near the Sutherland Church that he ran for one of the Sutherlands owned the store. And there was a flood somewhere in the late 20s that damaged it. And then he moved the store down to where you know the old building is today, you know, half a mile down the road. And I bet the sale was getting rid of the damaged the stuff once that store building had been damaged by the flood because yeah. it was never used again. Interesting. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.